All right, so we'll get going. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, my name is Kari Kwas, and we will, I'm your host this evening. So as you ask questions through the Q&A and such, or if you have any technical questions in the chat, um, I'll help you with that. Um, I'm the Community Engagement Project Manager at Snohomish Conservation District. And I'm, I'm the lead for the uh, I Love Lake program in partnership with the city of Lake Stevens. I'll talk more about that. Um, if you've been on one of our webinars, you've probably seen this photo, but we would have gathered in person and this would have been fun. We probably would have been at the senior center or somewhere in Lake Stevens. Um, but instead, a cat um, may join us at some point in time during this presentation. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, tonight's presentation, again, is Living with Beavers, and um, this is in partnership with the City of Lake Stevens. We're very grateful for their partnership. Uh, we do a lot of the outreach and education, and then we help with some implementation projects there. And most of it goes under the banner of I Love Lake. You may have seen that logo before. So here is the three of us. John Stevens is with us this evening from the City of Lake Stevens, as well as Elisa Kerr from Snohomish Conservation District and she'll be the one providing most of the talk tonight, but John's here to answer any questions that are specific to Lake Stevens. So as far as interacting with us, um, all of you are on mute and we can't see you, so you can be wearing pajamas or whatever, no big deal. Um, please do the, use the chat at the bottom of the screen and the Q&A to ask your questions and we'll answer them throughout. There's some natural pauses, but if something you really just wanna know right then, please feel free to ask and I will um, get Alicia, Elisa's attention. So a little bit about Snohomish Conservation District. We actually are based in Lake Stevens. We are uh, one of 45 conservation districts across the state of Washington. And we partner with cities and uh, landowners and everybody in the, just and their beaver I want to say but that's not quite right and their dog who wants to help protect the environment and so we are voluntary we're non-regulatory which means that we aren't the ones that are come and say if you don't do this you're gonna get a fine or then you need to do some work what we're gonna do is we're gonna help you work through whatever your challenge is so we call us, we'll come out, we'll take a look, and we can provide some technical assistance or other how-to information. We have a ton of information on our website. We like to do webinars like this. If we could be in person, we would. And it's very sad that Aquafest would be this weekend, but unfortunately it is canceled this year. So anyway, we would have had rain barrels at the booth and at the beautiful park you now have in Lake Stevens. So next year, we're gonna be hopeful for that. So feel free to reach out to us at any time for assistance. So I just wanted to touch on the I Love Lake program. This started in about 2014 and it was related to the algae that was in the lake. Um, so when we are not good with our fertilizer or lawn clippings or other the runoff from our cars, if we wash our car at our houses, all that stuff streams into the lake and it can cause lots of problems. So, the program was um, instituted to provide, you know, lake friendly practices to that end. We started two years ago with the Cascade Award, which is a uh, lake friendly gardening, sustainable gardening practice. And so you can still go to the website, ilovelake.org and apply um, to be nominated for that. We added living with beavers because as Elisa will share, there are um, beavers all over Lake Stevens. And so they can be good friends and maybe not so good friends. So we will explain how that goes too. Lawns to lettuce has been added this year so you can uh, get help if you're trying to grow a food garden. Also, we help with stormwater and can provide rain barrels, natural yard care. And one thing that they've asked us this year for is detention pond help. So maybe you've seen John by your uh, homeowners association and he's looking for something in the weeds that's him. Um, and those are the responsibility of the homeowners association. So we'll be touching more on that in the fall. So with us then this evening, we have John Stevens. He's the stormwater technician with the city of Lake Stevens. He's a busy guy. Every time I talk to him, he's somewhere else. And even last weekend, he was dealing with a beaver who created a dam and a culvert over the weekend, you know, just a weekend project. So um, you can get a hold of John if you have any questions, but you can also get a hold of Elisa. 
and um, she works with me at the district. She's also the executive director of Beavers Northwest, so she's busy as a beaver, as they say, and um, she's going to walk through her slides, so some cute animal photos, but a lot of information tonight about beavers and um, things that we can do to keep them in place. So without further ado, I'd like to turn over the power to Elisa. Thanks, Kari. Um, I'll just pull up my slides here. Great. Everybody see it? We feeling good? Perfect. Okay, so as Kari mentioned, we're talking a lot about beavers. I run the Living with Beavers program at the Snohomish Conservation District. So any questions you have about beavers, I can answer and hopefully we'll answer a few of those tonight. Um, Normally, I love being out in the field. I love diving in with my chest waders into beaver ponds and installing devices to help manage beavers. Um, and we've been doing a little bit less of that in COVID, um, but I still get to talk about beavers and still going out on site visits and helping folks uh, deal with them. Um, but of course, right now, as Kari mentioned, things are a little bit different. This is the last beaver webinar I gave and my cat kind of jumped up. I've currently got him sequestered. We just moved to a new place, so he's sequestered in the back. But if you hear any yowls, I promise there's no animal cruelty going on. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about beavers, really who they are and what they're doing, and why you should care about what they're doing <laughs> beyond just, oh my gosh, my yard is flooded or this road is looking a little, water's looking a little high next to this road. And then we'll also cover how does Snohomish CD fit in. And in this case, how does Snohomish CD fit in with the city of Lake Stephens? Um, because we have a really great partnership going on with beaver management. Um, so I just want to start things off with a poll. Kari's going to throw up a poll here with, uh, we just have two questions. Um, and first, I just want to know about, has anybody ever seen a beaver? Oh, and why are you tuning in tonight is the other question. <laughs> so um, polls will pop up on your screen. Please provide an answer. Um, have you ever seen a beaver? First off, couple options here. Seen them on your property, seen them while recreating, never seen them, or you're not sure. Maybe you've seen some semi-aquatic rodent and you're uncertain who it was. So please select an answer and we'll, this will help us move forward. All right, there we go. Let me share the results on that one. Awesome. Okay, so lots of folks have seen them while recreating, some on their property, and a few folks have never seen them. Um, so that's great. I love that. We'll talk a little bit about uh, where you can see them and how you can see them. All right, and there's the other one. Perfect. So I just want to know why you're tuning in tonight. It'll help me tailor my talk a little bit. We can focus on different areas depending on what everybody's interest is. Um, generally, we're going to talk, like I said, about beavers, but we'll also talk about managing them. Um, and of course, if you just love lake, this, that's a great reason to tune into this. There's lots of beavers in Lake Stevens. And um, I hope that you tune into everything that Snohomish CD does because we have a lot of really great programming. Perfect. Okay, great. So we've got a lot of a couple of folks here for managing beavers on their property and just generally learning about beavers, which is great. And wow, someone loves lake. I love that. Perfect. Okay, so we'll move on through. We'll focus a little bit more on the management as well as, you know, what's going on here with beavers. Um, so really, these are the little weirdo rodents that we're talking about, beavers. Um, and the first thing that I like to impress upon folks, it seems like Many of you have seen beavers, um, but the first thing I like to show is that beavers are huge. So beavers are between 25 and 70 pounds on average, um, which is really big. Think like medium sized dog, right? Even to a big sized dog, beavers are really huge. And, and that means that they have a really huge impact on the areas that they're occupying, right? Um, so I think a lot of folks think of beaver and they think, oh, maybe just like a cute little water rat. And really, that's not what a beaver is. They're huge. Um, and beavers are all throughout North America. There's two species of beaver in the world, the North American beaver and the European or Eurasian beaver. We're going to focus primarily on North American beaver, but they're pretty similar between the two of them and have seen kind of similar trends in population, etc. Um, so this map, the darker green, shows generally where beavers are. 
Um, beavers don't perfectly follow political boundaries. There are some beavers that venture into Mexico, but this is kind of a simplified uh, population map. Um, and beavers really are living, as you may notice, pretty much anywhere in North America where there is water and woody vegetation. Those are kind of the two requirements for beavers habitation. Um, so you'll notice that they're not up in the uh, northern Arctic tundra where we don't have a lot of water available and not a lot of woody vegetation available. And then of course beavers also are not in the deserts, right? There's no water, no woody vegetation for them. So those are kind of the two things. Other than that, they're spread pretty well across all of North America. Um, there are several doppelgangers. So as I mentioned, uh, it's sometimes you just see a little semi-aquatic rodent swimming along in that cute little brown head and it's hard to tell who it might be. Um, so besides beavers in our area, we also have nutria. Um, nutria are a little bit smaller than beavers, but they occupy many of the same habitats. Um, and we do have nutria in Washington. They're kind of throughout North America as well. Unfortunately, um, they are not from North America. They're from South America and were introduced to North America for fur and are considered somewhat an invasive species. They, they tend to be more diggers than beaver and cause a lot of erosion issues. Um, and oftentimes beavers get blamed for some of the issues that we see from nutria. So um, nutria are a little bit smaller than beavers and then of course have this rat-like tail, very different from our big flat beaver tail. Um, and then I also like to note too that their whiskers on the nutria are very conspicuous. They're bright white, whereas the beavers, kind of hard to see them. They're, they're shorter and darker, and so you don't really see the beaver whiskers. So if you're really close enough to see whiskers on this critter swimming in near your property or um, while you're recreating, look for those whiskers. If they're bright, white, conspicuous, probably a nutria, and then often look for that dive. Unfortunately, neither of them stick their tail up in the air while they're swimming, but if they do dive, then you can get a look at the tail sometimes. Um, and then we also have muskrats in the area. Muskrats are very, very small compared to beaver. Um, they are really that little water rat um, that you might have imagined <laughs> as a beaver. Um, and muskrats, the main difference is that size and their tail, which is rat-like, similar to a nutria. Um, but once again, all three of these critters tend to be in similar areas. We also have river otters in our area. Um, they are not rodents. So these other three, beavers, muskrats, nutria, all rodents. River otters are not, they're mustelids, totally different. Um, they are kind of like a long and skinny wiener dog compared to all these other guys. They have much shorter legs, a longer, thinner body, and really big, long tail. So less of a rat-like tail, more of a thick, rudder-like tail. Um, but we do have river otters around and you can see them kind of swimming in, or, you know, in ponds and things like that. And um, the last critter that I want to mention is a mountain beaver, which many folks ask me about often when I'm talking about beavers as a salmon beaver expert. And they say, well, what about mountain beavers? Um, and mountain beavers are weirdos. They are not really closely related to beavers. They are rodents like these other ones, um, but they're not really similar to beavers in many other ways. Um, they're kind of a funky little creature. They're a very kind of um, prehistoric, I guess that's not the right term, but a much older rodent. Um, and so they're just kind of funky. Um, they tend to dig, they spend a lot of time underground, um, they eat some vegetation, but certainly not the thick woody vegetation that beavers eat. Um, and often, like I said, they're underground, so you don't see them very much. Um, they're not really super associated with aquatic habitats either. Um, so kind of funky weirdos called mountain beavers, who knows. Um, but not related to, or not closely related to our friend, the big beaver. So our beavers have some kind of funky eating habits. They are considered choosy generalist herbivores. So they eat plants as herbivores and they're generalists, which means they'll eat pretty much anything, but they're choosy, which means they have specific things that they prefer to eat. So uh, beavers will eat herbaceous vegetation like water lilies and other things, or, you know, floating vegetation. Um, but they also eat woody vegetation. And so they're eating, when they're eating woody vegetation, they don't just chew down every little piece of the trunk. Um, what they're really eating is the bark and the cambium, which is the layer just underneath the bark. So you'll notice beaver chewed sticks where they have eaten them, like this photo up in the top right. They have chewed off the bark and then you'll see some little beaver teeth marks 
kind of into the wood itself, but they don't eat the whole thing. Um, you'll find these sticks that look denuded. They've had their bark chewed off and the beavers had a nice tasty snack. Um, some of the species that beavers prefer are willows and cottonwoods. And willows and cottonwoods have this amazing ability to re-sprout. So you'll notice here this photo on the left is a beaver chewed stump, uh, identified kind of by this pointy look to it with those little teeth marks. Um, and that stump has been chewed down. But then in the spring, that stump sends out new shoots. It's got a really healthy root system. It's still really strong and sends out all these new shoots and so the really interesting thing about some of the species that beavers prefer to chew down and eat is that they do have this ability to re-sprout. So often I hear folks worried about, you know, oh my gosh, beavers are really chewing everything down, all the trees are going to die. And the beautiful part is that sometimes they don't die. And sometimes what's happening is that beavers are just really changing that vegetation structure, right? We're getting shrubbier growth on some of these willows and cottonwoods. Um, so pretty special. That being said, you know, they do chew down trees and sometimes those trees die, but there's different, um, different reasons that that might be beneficial. So like I mentioned, um, th these stumps have kind of this really uh, characteristic shape of being that really pointy with those teeth marks. Uh, normally at this point, if we were in person, I would hand around some awesome beaver chewed sticks and I would hand around my beaver skulls um, to show off their amazing teeth. The front teeth of the beaver, you'll notice in both these photos here, the front of the teeth is coated, it's orange, and it is coated with, it's got some iron in it. Um, but the back of their teeth does not have that iron. And so you'll notice that on this side view of the skull, the teeth really form this chisel-like shape. Um, as they're chewing on trees and all this hard woody vegetation, uh, the back of their teeth is wearing away more quickly than the front of their teeth. So really they're self-sharpening as they're chewing. And beavers, are their teeth are continuously growing throughout their lives. So they're constantly chewing and chiseling and sharpening those teeth. Um, but they're also chewing to get those trees to eat and to build their dams. Uh, because beavers are so well known for this, this dam building. This is really the crux of why beavers are important and you know, why we have such a struggle with beavers is this big impact that they have in building dams. And here I've got several photos of different dams uh, to point out that not all beaver dams are created equally. Beavers will build dams primarily classically out of sticks and mud, but sometimes they're utilizing whatever vegetation is available. So this photo in the top left, you'll notice that the dam is mostly just mud kind of packed up um, the bottom photo here is really that sticks and mud, kind of that classic look of a beaver dam that you might be used to. And then the top right here, this is a dam that was built in a kind of agricultural drainage ditch in the middle of a reed canary grass field. And so the dam itself was built primarily just out of reed canary grass root balls and just kind of loose material. Um, so like I said, not all dams are created equal. And beavers will really utilize whatever is available. I've seen stones uh, quite commonly in dams. I've seen trash in urban areas. You know, beavers will utilize kind of all the litter that's around. Um, but really, whatever is available, beavers are putting in there. And primarily, they're building these dams to give themselves a better place to live. Beavers are really awkward on land. They're kind of have short stubby legs and those webbed back feet, so they really can't move very quickly on land, but they are so sleek and fast and smooth in the water. And so by damming an area and backing up more water, they're just creating more ponded habitat, more space for themselves to swim around in, get better access to the perimeters of that pond to more food, um, and be safe from predators, have a nice safe place to live. And uh, I like to point out too, many folks have a misconception of beavers living in their dams, but truly these dams are, are to back up water and build habitat. And then in that pond and area that they create, the beavers are building their home, which is a lodge. So these are several different examples of lodges. Um, as we've talked about, beavers are huge. So these lodges are often also very huge, as you'll see in this top right photo of three folks standing on top of a lodge. Um, and the lodges can also kind of have many different ways that they're built, um, but they often are just this kind of domed, it looks like a pile of sticks that someone has thrown there. 
Sometimes they're in the middle of a pond. Sometimes they're right up against the edge of a pond. Sometimes beavers will do kind of a combo of a bank den where they'll burrow into the side of a stream or a pond um, or utilize a previously dug den and then start piling sticks on top of it. So you'll kind of see, a, you know, a little combo of that. Um, if you see all these other signs of beavers, dams, chewed trees, but you can't find a lodge, um, never fear. The beavers are probably living somewhere in a bank den or something like that. Um, so these lodges are great. Um, and the lodges themselves have underwater entrances because, as I mentioned, beavers, very awkward on land, very smooth and sleek in the water. So these lodges have underwater entrances that make it so that beavers can get in, but other predators cannot as easily get in. And so they'll swim into their lodge from these underwater entrances and then have a nice dry chamber to, to rest in, uh, in the center of their lodge. This here is a photo from inside of a beaver lodge. There was an awesome live stream camera at the Mendenhall uh, Glacier area where they had wedged a camera into a beaver lodge, amazingly. Um, and beavers are primarily nocturnal, so often I would tune in during the day and see the beavers just cuddled up and sleeping or, you know, twitching, dreaming. Um, and so they are living inside of this beautiful little dry chamber inside of one of these big lodges in the middle of a pond. Um, and beavers do live in family groups. So usually there's a mama and a papa beaver that build a lodge and a dam together. Um, and then they have one to three kits each year. And then those kids stay with them until they're about two years old. So you can have a colony of beavers that's, you know, maybe just one bachelor or bachelorette beaver or all the way up to seven to 10 beavers um, that are all living together. And those uh, juvenile beavers are helping mom and dad to maintain the lodge, maintain the dam, take care of the new kids each year. Um, and they hang out with them uh, until they're ready to move on and find their own place. Um, so these teenage beavers, these two-year-old beavers, are the ones that are dispersing out and finding a new home, finding a mate, uh, finding a place to live. So those teenage beavers often, to me, are the ones that cause kind of weird problems, right? They don't exactly know what they're doing yet in the world. They're just kind of building weird dams and weird places or chewing on weird things, and um, often they're, they're moving on. So um, sometimes if you see some weird sudden beaver activity and then it disappears, that's quite often probably one of these teenage beavers out in the world trying to find their own way. So, okay, so I'm going to pause now for questions. Um, if you have any questions, make sure to type them into the chat box and then Kari's going to let me know if we have any questions that I can answer. Right now there are no questions. Perfect. Coming up next is some uh, beaver benefits. All right, there's a question. <laughs> Great. Let's see. So do you find more otters around beaver dens? That's a great question. Um, you know, I have not done an extensive study of otters, but certainly the habitat that beavers create does build habitat that also is good for otters. Um, so we do certainly see otters associated with beaver wetlands, um, but otters also are making their own way and doing their own thing in a lot of other places. So they do coexist in certain areas, but I don't know if there's a direct correlation of like, oh yeah, otters are always around beaver ponds. <laughs> and here's another question um, from Alan. Is there a difference between bank beavers and those who build lodges from sticks? Great question. Um, not necessarily, um, you know, Beavers, we only have one species of beaver around here. Um, and it's possible that there is, you know, a beaver that has just a particular drive to always want to live in a bank den. Um, and, you know, I, I like to think of it similar to people, right? Like we have our own desires and wants and needs and we have certain tendencies that all people do this, but then there's other people that do their own thing. And so beavers are the same way, right? Like we can say all beavers build lodges, but then maybe there's a beaver who's like, I'm tired and I don't want to build a lodge. I'm just going to burrow in here. Um, so there isn't a, you know, strict difference between bank beavers and lodge building beavers. Um, but it could just be a personal preference. Um, we do sometimes see too that, you know, a, a bachelor or bachelorette beaver might just utilize an old 
bank lodge if it was an otter lodge or you know or a big an otter home or a previous beaver they'll just utilize that rather than putting all the effort into a lodge Thanks, Elisa. I just uh, one question for me. How long do beavers usually live? If their young stays with them for two years, how, how long do they live in their whole life? Yeah, I've heard 10 to 15 years is pretty common. Okay. All right. We don't have any other questions at this time. Perfect. Great. We'll move into beaver benefits. Okay, so uh, really the benefits that we see from beavers come from the dams that beavers build. Um, beavers in themselves are cute and great, but the dams that they build are really what result in uh, so many benefits and the reason why we at the Conservation District have a Living with Beavers program and why I work at a nonprofit that <laughs> is devoted to um, beaver solutions. So the benefits of beavers are in these dam dams that they build. Um, and we call beavers ecosystem engineers because as beavers are building these dams, they're truly changing the ecosystem that they're living in. They could take just a totally straight stream, add a few dams and create this really complex and different ecosystem. Um, and so truly the crux of this is that they are building complexity by building these dams. So this results in a lot of different benefits, one of which is increases in aquatic habitat. Um, so these are just a couple different photos of some beaver areas, right? Um, and this aquatic habitat that they build is multifaceted. There are snags from areas that have been flooded out and trees have died or trees that beavers have chewed. And those snags are really great for animals like woodpeckers or cavity nesting birds or raptors that need places to perch. Um, we also built really good habitat for waterfowl, including, you know, ducks all the way to herons, all these birds that utilize wet, wet systems. Um, amphibians, of course, benefit, especially amphibians that are pond breeding amphibians. They need areas to lay their eggs that are wet for a longer period of time. We also see increases, already mentioned, in otters and other mammals that utilize these wet areas. Um, lots of increases in invertebrates, including dragonflies, but also lots of other stream invertebrates and bugs that live in the water. And then, of course, we see increases in fish, particularly because we've created this habitat where there's a lot more invertebrates, but also because we've created this complexity where fish like juvenile salmonids can hide, right? If we've got more structure in the stream, there's more places for them to hide, these deeper, cooler water areas for them to sit in. Um, so beaver ponds are noted as really great rearing habitat for salmonids, especially for coho, who like to spend a lot of time in fresh water um, as juvenile fish. Um, so, and of course, speaking about fish, one of the questions that I get often is what about fish passage, right? We have this huge um, investment in salmon in our region for a lot of good reasons. And beaver dams seem inherently to be against that, right? We want fish to be able to get through these systems and how do they do that if a beaver dam is in the way? Um, luckily, beavers and salmon have both been here for a lot longer than all of the white settlers that have straightened streams and done a lot of other weird stuff and built concrete dams. Um, and so I like to, I've heard a phrase that uh, beavers taught salmon to jump right? We know that salmon are really good jumpers. We know that they can get over structures and streams. Um, and a natural beaver dam in a natural stream is not a barrier to fish. In the fall and winter, we get these big rains that tend to overtop beaver dams and just kind of flow over and around the dams themselves, providing really great passageways for fish to jump over. In addition, beaver dams are not perfect barriers. They are not like the concrete dams that people build. They have all of these little interstitial spaces, little areas where water is flowing through the sticks. And this is really great passage for juveniles that are heading downstream. So juvenile fish can get through, squiggle through all of these little beaver dams because they aren't perfect barriers. Water is continuing to flow. So fish passage is certainly a concern and something that we want to be aware of. Um, and beaver dams can be fish passage barriers seasonally if we're not getting a lot of flow or if we have a system that has been so modified by people, right? Think about like a concrete lined channel that is just like 10 feet deep and then beavers build a dam and water is never going to get over and around that and fish aren't going to be able to get over and around that. 
So certainly beaver dams can be uh, cause problems in these really heavily modified systems, but a natural beaver dam is not a fish passage barrier, certainly. Um, and then another benefit to these dams is that beaver dams help to improve water quantity. Um, storing water in these ponds helps to hold on to water throughout the year. As I mentioned, the dams aren't perfect, so water is kind of continuing to trickle uh, through the dam and provide more water downstream. There's also a lot of water being pushed into the ground and improving, recharging our groundwater. Um, so storing water is big. It can help attenuate floods, having these wetlands and these big beaver ponds around to hold on to water, store that water um, as we get big storm events. So that's a really big benefit and something that we at the district are really focused on. This is a really great graphic also from King County. They have a great beaver working group um, that produces a lot of really great beaver information and beaver graphics. So I highly recommend if you have other questions, that's a really great resource. Um, and this is a really cool graphic of beavers interacting with the water cycle. Um, and another benefit that beavers have is of course improving water quality. Um, so as beaver dams are holding onto that water and having these nice slow moving sections, these nice slow moving wetlands, um, it allows sediment to settle out. And so we get these kind of silty beaver ponds, but then downstream what we get is this really beautiful, fresh, clean gravel, which is really important for salmon spawning habitat. Um, additionally, wetlands are really great at cleaning up water and they can um, help reduce nitrogen and phosphorus levels, utilizing all the bacteria that are living in those wetlands, utilizing all the plants living around and in and on the edges of these wetlands. Um, so wetlands are really important improving water quality as well. Um, so all of these things together equal ecosystem resilience, right? We're building aquatic habitat, improving water quality, improving water quantity, and building resilience through our ecosystems just by having beavers on the landscape. Um, and this is really particularly important as we consider climate change and the effects that that's going to have. This is a pretty simplified example of a hydrograph showing stream flows in our region uh, throughout the season. So you'll notice that um, our y-axis here is stream flows, x-axis -axis is time by season. In the winter, we see a lot of rain. We get a lot of rain in our area, and then our streams levels are high, and that kind of drops off through the summer and our streams get low, and then that repeats, right? It's kind of a cycle. Um, once again, very simplified. With climate change, what we're seeing is higher temperatures um, and we're seeing changes in precipitation as well. And so what we're seeing is we're going to have more rain in the winter and less rain in the summer. And so what that's going to do is really shift our hydrograph here, right? We're going to see these bigger peak events and these much lower summer events, even potentially drying out some streams seasonally. By adding beavers into this, we can reverse that trend a little bit, right? Beavers building dams can help to attenuate these high peak flood events. Beavers storing water throughout the season can also help to bring up those summer low flows by continuing to provide water inputs throughout the year and hopefully keeping streams running year round. So beavers can help mitigate climate change a little bit too, which I think is just a really cool thing to be thinking about as utilizing these rodents to help us mitigate and adapt to climate change and really building that resilience. Okay, so up next is gonna be beaver management, but I wanted to pause in case folks had any questions about the benefits of beavers. There aren't any written in right now, but feel free to do so and I'll ask. I've also um, shared if people have on Facebook, if they're listening and watching, they can ask there and I can pass those questions on too. Perfect. All right, seeing none, I would say move on to the next. Perfect. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about here, our last topic is beaver management. Um, of course, Beavers dam building, we all agree, nobody even has questions about how great it is and all the benefits that there are to beavers and their dam building. Um, but that dam building also often comes into conflict with 
you know, everything that we as people are trying to do, right? We have built a lot of roads, a lot of homes, a lot of agriculture, along waterways. And these are the exact places that beavers want to be as well. Um, so we see a lot of different beaver conflicts. Um, and luckily, there are solutions for all of these beaver conflicts. So I'm going to walk through each of these and talk about kind of the problems and solutions that we have on offer um, and the ways that the district fits in. So with any beaver issue, um, beaver trapping is an option. In Washington, it is legal to trap beavers. Um, it is legal to trap and kill beavers. You have to hire a certified trapper, um, but it is legal to trap and kill beavers. Um, but of course, then that totally eliminates all of the benefits that we've just talked about. Um, luckily in Washington, we are a state that does allow beaver relocation, um, and it is only recently legal to relocate beaver beavers in Western Washington. And so this is kind of a new thing. Um, right now, the Tulalip tribes are the only program in our region that does relocation um, and they do an amazing job of it. They've been doing it for several years. They take conflict beavers from the lowlands um, and move them up into forest service lands in the mountains and primarily as a restoration tool, utilizing this dam building uh, ability of beavers to restore areas in the upper watersheds to help hold on to water and to help mitigate those climate effects of climate change. Um, relocation is really great, uh, but it, it truly is just a restoration strategy. If you have a property that is really great beaver habitat and beavers are there and building dams and chewing on all your willows, and then you relocate them, uh, it is highly likely that another beaver will move in and soon. Um, we are seeing more and more beavers on the landscape in our region. There's a lot of beavers in Lake Stevens that we already know about. And so relocating beavers is truly temporary if you have that really good beaver habitat. So it's important to remember that. Um, it, it is a really good tool. It's a great restoration tool and it's great to manage in the short term. But considering in place management strategies, ways that you can coexist with beavers and live with them on your property is, is really going to be the best long term solution. Um, so we'll talk about some of those, those uh, you know, different strategies. First off, a type of beaver conflict is a tree chewing, right? This is a really classic. Beavers love to chew on trees. It's kind of what they do. Um, but luckily, we can stop them. Um, so we do wrap trees. Wrapping trees is super effective in stopping beavers. Um, but there are a few tips that are really important to remember. Um, I've got two examples here. This is on the left here is a restoration site that we planted um, and we fenced some small trees to help them grow bigger, just to get them up. Because if we've just got all those little tiny baby trees, beavers can just mow them down. But if we get them all grown up enough that they're healthy and strong, then they'll only chew on a few of them and they'll be strong enough to re-sprout and grow if they're willows or cottonwoods. Um, but then also we have the strategy of wrapping just big precious trees, right? If you've just got this awesome really giant cottonwood on your property and you don't want the beavers to get it, but you don't care about all those other little willows, then let's wrap that nice big cottonwood and keep that safe. Um, so my big tip with fencing is that I have to be tall, right? We talked about beavers are huge. And so I recommend fencing that's at least three foot tall. And that way um, beavers can't just stand up and chew right over your fencing. Um, unfortunately, I have seen folks that put up just one foot high fencing and beavers chew right over the top of it. Um, so really, truly putting in that fencing that's tall enough is really important. Um, and then I also recommend use, using garden fencing and not just chicken wire. Um, a single layer of chicken wire wrapped right against a tree, a beaver can chew right through that. So making sure that you're using something a little bit stronger wrapping it maybe a little farther out from the tree so that tree has room to grow. Um, and if you do use chicken wire, wrapping it maybe a couple times around, but knowing that your tree is gonna keep growing, so you don't wanna just wrap it really tight um, and, and restrict that tree's growth. So fencing, very easy option to throw up there. Um, another beaver conflict that we see quite often is culvert blockage. Uh, luckily, we're trending towards bigger culverts, right? That, that uh, convey a lot more water, but unfortunately what we've seen is even with these big culverts, this one here is a 12 foot diameter culvert, that beavers can still block it, right? They're still still getting in there. 
beavers see culverts as this hole in a perfectly good dam, right? This roadbed is an awesome giant dam that's just blocking up this flow. So if they could just block across there, they've got a, a wetland ready made for them. So culverts are really common. This bottom photo here, you might be able to just see that culvert there in the top right corner, um, totally plugged. So culvert blockages are really, really common. Um, but there's a really good solution, uh, exclusion fencing, sometimes called beaver deceivers. They're essentially just a trapezoidal shaped fence that comes out from the culvert on the upstream side and just moves beavers away from that constriction of flow, right? They're drawn to culverts because they can feel and hear the water flowing in that pipe and moving into that smaller area. And so by moving them away from that pipe and away from that sound and feel of water, they're totally fooled and often don't rebuild. Um, sometimes what we will see is these are designed so that they might rebuild right here close to the culvert, but they're not gonna build around the whole entire fence. Admittedly, we are putting a fence in a waterway, and so there is some maintenance that comes along with that, right? You're gonna see some, some debris rack up on this fence, but it's pretty easy to just climb in there and pull it out um, and just keeping an eye on it to make sure there's not too much stuff getting on there so that it's then really loud and making enough noise that beavers are attracted to build there again. Um, but exclusion fencing is a really awesome solution as well. Um, and then the last problem that we see that's pretty common is just general flooding, right? These dams are being built to flood an area. That's the goal of the beavers is they want to flood an area. Um, but sometimes that area is our backyards or our septic drain field or our basements for a roadway. And so really we wanna be managing beavers and that flooding. Um, so the solution that we have here is called a pond leveler. Um, down here on the bottom is kind of a plan view and this is one in action here in Lake Stevens. Um, and so essentially what we're doing here with these pond levelers is putting a pipe through a dam to manage that water level and manage that dam height. Um, the cage is on the inlet, so water in both these photos is flowing from left to right, um, flowing down through the dam and through the pipe. Um, so the cage around the inlet is to keep beavers from blocking up that inlet um, and keep that water flowing. Uh, and these devices are really, really great, but they are a compromise, right? If we are managing beavers, we're trying to coexist with beavers and keep them in place. These devices need to be installed such that there is still plenty of habitat for beavers and plenty of wetland area to maintain all of these benefits, including water storage and improving water quality. Um, so this is really a compromise between people and beavers. We're managing um, water levels, but we're also giving the beavers a little bit of habitat. So there has to be enough room for these devices um, and for the beavers in the area. Because otherwise, if we just install one and bring it back down to zero, the beavers are gonna keep damming in different spots because now they've got no habitat, no pond. So um, pond levelers are awesome, a really great solution, but always a little bit of a compromise. And they do require maintenance as well, similar to the culvert exclusion fence where you're gonna need to be checking up on them, making sure that beavers aren't plugging anything up. So all of these types of beaver conflicts do have solutions. Tree chew, culvert blockage, general flooding, all these things we can manage. Um, and this is where Snohomish Conservation District comes in. So a big part of my job is coming out to help you figure out, you know, do, would one of these solutions work for you? Can we manage beavers on your property? Um, and how can we help install these? Um, we can assist with a lot of things. We can assist with site visits, primarily me coming out chatting with you about what's going on, figuring out what is the conflicts here and how can it be best managed. Um, we can help with permitting. Uh, pond levelers and exclusion fences do require permitting um, to put them in with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, SCD can also assist with materials and installation. So we can help pay for some of the materials for these devices if your uh, property qualifies and we can help install utilizing uh, labor. This is our wonderful Washington Conservation Corps crew helping me install a pond leveler here in Lake Stevens. Um, so we can help install these devices too so you don't have to climb in with your chest waders because that's my favorite part. Um, so right now we do have a grant uh, through the Department of Ecology that is funding work in some targeted watersheds that include Lake Stevens as well as Snohomish and Monroe, these kind of outlined in green areas. 
are areas that we're really targeting to do beaver work because they're really important areas for water storage. We want to keep beavers on the landscape if we can everywhere, but especially in these watersheds. So um, if you live in Lake Stevens, uh, this is a really great opportunity to uh, have me out and hopefully we can keep beavers on your property uh, through, you know, some sort of installation. Um, and then I just wanted to point out too, you know, John, I'm sure knows about many other locations, but I know of at least these few locations where there are beavers all around Lake Stevens. So there are a ton of beavers in Lake Stevens. Um, if you live in Lake Stevens and are on a waterway, you've likely seen some impacts from beavers um, and they're not going away anytime soon. So um, we have this really great partnership with the city of Lake Stevens. Um, and we have this other great opportunity with funding from the Department of Ecology that overlaps. So we're in a really good spot to help manage beavers in Lake Stevens um, and in the surrounding areas. So I'm happy to help out in any way that's possible as folks are dealing with beaver issues. Um, I do have a few other resources that I wanna share with everybody, um, including we have a better ground fact sheet um, we have many better ground fact sheets, but one of them is about beavers. So if you are interested or if you have a neighbor who has beavers on their property and you want to tell them all about this, you can hand them this fact sheet and send them a link to our recorded um, talk tonight once that comes out. Um, there's also a great page on the Department of Fish and Wildlife website called Living with Wildlife. They have a really great fact sheet on beavers that's a little more extensive than the one that we have. Um, and then if you really want to dive in and you're like, oh my gosh, I love everything about beavers and want to know more, there's the Beaver Restoration Guidebook, which was published by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and you can just Google it, find it. It's really easy to find. Um, and it has really extensive information about kind of the benefits of beavers and some management strategies. Um, so I'm happy to take any other questions. And my contact information is on here. The best way to reach me right now is by email. Um, I'm working from home, so my office phone, I'm checking infrequently. Um, but if you'd rather call and leave me a voicemail, just know I probably won't get back to it for a week or so. <laughs> but um, emails are great too. Okay, Kari, questions, I'm ready. We got them, okay. So first we have, are released beavers tagged? And if so, do they return to their old haunts? Uh, relocated pinnipeds get back to their original location? Yeah, great question. So the all I can speak to is the Tulalip Tribes program because that's one that I know well. Um, so the Tulalip Tribes take beavers from the lowlands and move them pretty far up into the uplands. Um, and they do not tag them with any GPS or anything like that. They do tag them with little colored earrings um, so that if they capture a picture of them, then they can say, oh yeah, that's that beaver. Um, and so, you know, what they've seen is they're not tracking with GPS, so they don't know exactly where the beavers go. Um, but what they've seen is they have a 50% success rate of beavers staying in the same spots and building dams in that spot uh, within a year after the release. So that means at least 50% of the beavers are staying put and doing their thing where they're released at. Um, you know, I don't know, what I don't know is if you took a beaver from a pond right here and moved them two miles downstream, whether they would return <laughs> to that same spot. Um, but typically the programs that are relocating right now are moving them much farther and beavers are pretty much stay put. All right. Thank you. Um, so another question, can salmon swim up pond le levelers? Great question. Um, and the answer is we don't know, but it's something that we're working on to figure out. Um, it, it really depends on the system. So beaver dams are all really different, right? And so sometimes a pond leveler might be really steep. And in that case, if it's a really steep dam, the pond leveler might be really steep. And in that case, it, fish may not be able to swim up it. But in many cases, they're pretty flat. They're likely okay for fish to swim up, but they are really small. So I like to um, design my pond levelers in such a way that we're kind of maintaining the natural function of a dam. So rather than thinking about fish swimming up the pipe and through the pipe that way, I want to be thinking about, okay, well, how are fish going to be moving over this dam in a natural system? So in that case, we're really shifting from thinking about pond levelers as managing pond levels and instead managing dam levels because we want those dams to be able to overtop with water in the winter when we get those big storm events and fish to be able to jump over them as they normally would through a normal dam. Um, so 
more to come on that on fish passage through over around levelers and dams with levelers. Um, we're working on getting some data on that. Thank you. Okay, another question. Can exclusion fencing be used to manage a dam where we aren't allowed by the state to put in a pond leveler? Yeah, great question. I know that there are some folks at the state, at Department of Fish and Wildlife, who are pushing for exclusion fences on dams. So their idea is that you would notch a dam and then install a fence around that notch so that beavers could not repair it. Um, I think it's worth a shot if, the, if Fish and Wildlife is not going to give a permit for a leveler, um, but I think it's likely to be difficult to maintain that, right? Beavers are just going to shove sticks in there or build all the way around that fence. Um, I certainly think that uh, it's an interesting suggestion and worth trying out, but um, I'm not convinced that it's the be-all end-all solution um, to fish passage and beaver dams and beaver management. All right, thank you again. Another question, uh, is there any illegal persecution of beavers in the area? Illegal persecution of beavers? Yeah. Um, well, it's legal to trap beavers as long as you're licensed or if you're on your own property. Um, but I don't know of any other like enforcement of beaver trapping or anything like that. John, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I know you know more about trapping than I do. Yeah, for trapping them, you're, you got to go through, uh, how I did mine was I went through the Washington State um, Game Department and went through a trapping class, had to do the test and get all your knowledge on doing that of trapping the animals and Everything that I know of is you have to have a trapping license and use a live trap. And it's best if you're not familiar with the traps and how to do it is contact somebody that is. And if anybody has questions on stuff like that, feel free to give me a call at City Hall and I'll answer all the questions I can. Yeah, that's a great point that it you have to use live traps here in Washington. The, you know, trap and kill traps are not legal. I have one comment from Facebook, which is interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have a beaver that they, or she says she watches on the Stillaguamish River there in Arlington. Awesome. It's great to be able to view beavers. Yeah, my recommendation if you want to see beavers is to go out at um, dawn or dusk and you'll see them in a beaver area. That's great. Any other questions um, that people have, please feel free to write them in the chat. And if you have any questions for the city for that matter, because John is here, so he can also help on that front. And I think John, you're getting a new certification. Is that correct here in the next few weeks? Yeah, and um, be the end of next month, um, I'll be a certif certified wild wildlife control officer. And so I'll be able to pretty much go out and help the more of the public at any time and help them with their problems with the beavers or, or any of the other um, so-called nuisance animals, you know, just help them, help them out and give them ideas of how to relocate them or, you know, if you have to, of what you need to do <laughs> is the easiest way to put it is, but um, I'm willing to do that and anytime you can just call and let me know and I'm out in the field all day long and I'll, I'll come and look at your problems and help you out. Cool, thanks John. Um, back to you Elisa, we have another question. Uh, from the first picture, it looked like the beaver had toenails. Is this accurate? Yeah, uh, they do have, you know, like, I don't want to call them claws, but they're claws on their front paws. Um, they can dig well with their front paws and they'll kind of dig up mud and everything. Um, but then they also on their back feet, they have webbed back feet and they do have little kind of toenails. Um, and one of those nails is specialized as a grooming tool. 
Um, so they do kind of groom themselves with their back feet and it helps um, keep them fresh. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, and they're, they're very thick. I, I call them very thick fingernails. I wouldn't call them a claw, but they are a very thick fingernail. Yeah. Maybe this is a question for John for me, but um, if I'm trying to get my cat into the carrier to go to the vet, <laughs> that's challenging enough sometimes. So how would one even catch a beaver, I guess, for that purpose? What kind of protection do you have as the capture or? Uh, for me is when I catch them in, um, I have what, six different types of um, live traps that I use. And the main one that I like using the best, it's called a suitcase trap. And then to transport them to the release site, I move them into a large box trap. And the only way to do it is with a, it's, a, it's called a non-strangling um, noose more or less. And that just keeps me safe and it keeps them safe. I can grab onto them with that and pick them up, which Again, they are very heavy, but I also wear, um, I wear a good pair of thick, thick leather gloves because I've seen what they can do to trees and, you know, m my fingers are a little softer than that. So I like to leave them there. That seems like a wise idea. <laughs> yeah. I think another presentation we had, uh, Elisa, someone had asked about how many beavers do we think there are in Snohomish County? And I, I know you Ooh. know have a guess but any ballpark idea no I don't have a ballpark idea um I do just generally know that we're seeing more and more beavers in the area um you know and, and I know of personally seven or eight sites in Lake Stevens that have beavers and each of those probably has two to seven beavers right so like we're seeing a lot of beavers in the area um but no strict numbers Cool. Any other questions from our audience this evening? All right. See. Well, if not, then I would just say thank you to everybody for attending this evening. Um, and just know that uh, you can reach us through the snohomishcd.org website, through the City of Lake Stevens website, or if you're on social media, just grab us on I Love Lake um, is the Facebook page, and we share things and events we're doing. We're hoping to do a rain barrel sale at some point in time when we're allowed to do so and get um, a booth or something at the farmer's market. So we'll see how the summer goes, but please reach out to us, and we're so glad you joined us this evening. Thank you, Elisa, again, a wonderful talk. It's so fantastic. I love learn something every time. And John, I'm really glad you could join us too. Any last words from either of you? Nope, thank you so much, Kari, nope. for hosting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, everybody, have a great night. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye.